to whether it is actually appropriate for us to celebrate our national holiday on January the 26th. Now, the reason for this debate, and it's a debate that's been going on now for some years, is because for our Indigenous sisters and brothers, uh, the 26th of January is not a day which they celebrate. Uh, for them, it's a day of great sadness. For the coming of white people to this country uh, marked a period for them when immeasurable harm has actually been perpetrated against them and their communities. Now, the other night uh, over dinner, uh, me and the family, we were talking about this particular debate. And during that discussion, I made the point that it wasn't all bad for Indigenous people when white people came to this country. And the key reason why it wasn't all bad is because with the white people came the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, on that first fleet was a Christian chaplain by the name of Richard Johnson, and he was the one who first preached the gospel on these shores. Indeed, if you go into the city uh, near Wynyard Station, you will see this monument. And it is a, a monument which commemorates the first ever sermon preached in this country by Richard Johnson on the 3rd of February, 1788. And the text for Richard Johnson's sermon that day, as we see on this uh, monument, is Psalm 116, verse 12. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits? Uh, how should I respond to all the good things that God has done for me? Was the question that Richard Johnson was posing. Uh, now, we don't have uh, a copy of Richard Johnson's sermon uh, from that day, but on the basis of things that Richard Johnson has written, uh, I suspect that there were two things that he had in mind as he spoke about the benefits that God had showered people with. I, I take it the first was the safe passage, the relatively safe passage that the First Fleet had from Britain, all those thousands of kilometres, to Sydney Harbour. Uh, speaking in terms of maritime things, it was a miracle that all 11 ships turned up with, I think it was 69 lives that were lost. Like, that was quite small compared to other sort of comparable fleets, especially those that came later to Australia. And so, no doubt, uh, Richard Johnson, as he was preaching, was encouraging people to be thankful for the safety that God had provided them as they had come to this far-flung land. But Richard Johnson was a gospel man, and I have no doubt that as he spoke about the benefits that God provides, he spoke ultimately about Jesus and the forgiveness of sins and the eternal life uh, that he provides, and that that is something that we should give thanks to God for. Anyway, as we recommence our sermon series today on the book of Acts, as we focus on Acts chapter 12, verse 25, through to chapter 13, verse 52, I think it will start to become obvious as to why and how the gospel ended up on these far-flung shores. And even though the arrival of white people to this country has brought immeasurable harm to our Indigenous sisters and brothers, it is also worth noting that the coming of the gospel has been a great blessing to those people as well. And we're going to hear why that is the case as we look at this passage. Now, there are two main things that I'm going to talk about today as we look at Acts 12.25 to chapter 13, verse 52. So let's now come to our first point, which is that God was actively working to fulfil his purpose of the gospel going to the ends of the earth. So as we recommence our sermon series on the book of Acts, it's good to be reminded of Acts chapter 1 verse 8 uh, where Jesus said these words, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Uh, this verse is an important one in the book of Acts because really the contents of the book of Acts follow the pattern that uh, Jesus speaks about here. Uh, so we see uh, the gospel going to Jerusalem, then to Judea and Samaria, and then we see it starting to go to the ends of the earth. Now, what's important to note in Jesus' command here 
is that these early Christians who were Jewish were not just to preach the gospel to Jews who were living in Jerusalem or Judea and Samaria or the ends of the earth. Now, have a look at what the Apostle Paul says in Acts 13, verse 47. He says, For this is what the Lord has commanded us, and here he quotes from Isaiah 49, verse 6, Isaiah 49, verse 6, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. 700 to 800 years before the time of Jesus, God spoke through Isaiah and he made it clear that he wanted to bring blessing, not just to Jews, but to Gentiles, non-Jews as well, even those scattered in far-flung lands like this one. But friends, it wasn't just 700 to 800 years ago that God made that clear. Go back a number of years before that to Abraham in Genesis 12. And God promised to Abraham in Genesis 12 that through him, blessing would come to peoples of all the nations. And that blessing, friends, is the overturning of the curse brought about by sin. God promised all the way back in Abraham's time that Jews and Gentiles would be able to access the blessing of having the curse of sin overturned. So it's very much God's will for the gospel to go to Jerusalem, to Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth, not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. Well, the question we have to ask is, uh, as we come to our section of the book of Acts today, so we're at the end of chapter 12, going into chapter 13, how have things gone in terms of this program that Jesus laid out to his disciples? Where are we at uh, as we come to our section today? Well, the map on the screen will uh, help us to get an idea. So, in Acts 2, uh, we see that the gospel was preached in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Uh, thousands were converted. It's interesting to note that there were people from all sorts of places, even as far flung as Rome, who were there on that day and converted and who no doubt went back trusting in Jesus to the place where they lived. When we come to Acts chapter 8, you might remember that in uh, Acts 7, uh, Stephen uh, was the first Christian martyr, the first Christian to be put to death. Uh, after that event of Stephen being put to death, a great persecution broke out against the Christians in Jerusalem so that all except for the apostles were scattered. And guess where they scattered? Places like Judea and Samaria. And as they went to those places, as they were scattered by this persecution, they took the gospel with them and proclaimed the gospel. So you read about Samaritans becoming Christians. You also read about an Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8 who is converted and goes back to his homeland following the Lord Jesus Christ. But then we start to see Gentiles starting to become Christian. So in Acts 10 and 11, we read about how Peter goes to Caesarea where he preaches the gospel to a man, a Gentile man named Cornelius and how Cornelius and friends and family become followers of Jesus. But also in Acts 11, we are told about how those who had been scattered by the persecution in Jerusalem also ended up in places like Cyprus, sharing the gospel of Jesus. And how they also ended up all the way up north, here in a place called Antioch. And indeed, we are told that it was in Antioch that it wasn't just Jews hearing the gospel, but it was also Greeks who were hearing the gospel. And so the church in Antioch that we hear about in chapter 13 was very much a church made up of Jews and Gentiles together. Now, that's impressive, but it's not the ends of the earth, is it? Really, the gospel at this point is limited to Syria, to Palestine, to Cyprus, but there's still a long way to go on this mission. And it's in Acts 13 that we see God at work making sure that the gospel moved beyond these areas to keep on going towards the ends of the earth. Indeed, have a look at Acts 13, verses 1 to 3. We read, Now in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Major, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, and don't forget we learnt about Saul in Acts 9, didn't we? 
He was the great persecutor of Christians who on the road to Damascus was brought to his knees by God blinded and came to faith. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Notice the initiative that God, by his Spirit, takes in these verses. It is the Holy Spirit who calls for Barnabas and for Saul to be set apart for the mission that God had called them to. Now, we already know from Acts 9 that Paul had, and Saul had been called to go and reach the Gentiles. That was his job. And now here is the Spirit saying to the church, you need to release these people to send them off onto mission. Remember, the gospel's got to go to the ends of the earth. It can't just remain stuck in Antioch. It's got to go out. And so, uh, we read about how it is that the church, if you like, literally releases them for this task of mission. Now, the big point here, friends, is that God is taking the initiative to make sure that this gospel mission keeps on moving, that it keeps on spreading. Uh, one thing I just want to say briefly, if you're considering uh, being a missionary, I don't think this passage is telling us you have to wait to hear a voice uh, from the Holy Spirit saying, off you go. Uh, friends, I don't think that these uh, verses are prescribing what needs to happen if you want to go on the mission field. They're just simply describing, describing what took place at that time. And what took place at that time was that the Spirit called for Barnabas and Saul to be released to take the gospel further afield. And that's exactly what they do. In verse 4, we read the two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. Now, to put it in terms of a map, uh, so Barnabas and Saul were in, located in Antioch. They're called by the Spirit. They travel down the coast to Seleucia where they catch a boat over to Cyprus. And they land, first of all, in a place called Salamis and we're told that while they're there, they preach the gospel in the Jewish synagogues. Uh, we then see that they actually keep going across Cyprus and end up in a place called Paphos where they receive an invitation from a Roman proconsul by the name of Sergius Polus, a Gentile. Uh, he asks for them to come and to share the word of God with them. Uh, we hear that as uh, Barnabas and Saul share the gospel uh, with this man, that they have an opponent, a man named Bar-Jesus, literally son of salvation. Well, he proved to be anything but. He was a Jewish sorcerer. Uh, bent on trying to stop Sergius Polis from coming to faith. Well, anyway, by the power of God, uh, the attempts of this sorcerer are shut down. And Sergius Polis, amazed at the teaching of the Lord, it seems, comes to faith. So that's their little trip to Cyprus. But in chapter 13, we see they go further afield again. In verses 13 to 14a, from Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. From Perga, they went on to Pisidian Antioch. And so again, we come to our map. They sail from Paphos up to this place called Perga, which is located in modern-day Turkey. Uh, they don't spend much time in Perga, it seems. We'll see next week. They do come back and preach the gospel there. Uh, but they head north up to Antioch, Notice there's two Antiochs here. This is Pisidian Antioch. Um, and, and the events of chapter 13 really focus on their time in Pisidian Antioch. What we see at the end of uh, their ministry there, uh, they're actually sort of escorted out of town, if you like. And uh, they travel to Iconium. And next week we'll see how they go to Lystra and then Derby, And then they return back via these places, preaching the gospel in Perga and then back to home base. And so that's what we call the first missionary journey in the book of Acts. But uh, notice the gospel is now starting to move further afield than what it was to this point. And why did that happen? Because it was God by his spirit who called for Barnabas and Saul to be set apart and to be released and to take the gospel further afield. 
And why does that happen? Because we know that God wants the gospel to go to the ends of the earth, both to Jews and to Gentiles. Now, when you take all of that into account, it makes sense that the gospel eventually ended up in this far-flung land. Now, how was it that the gospel actually ended up here? How did Richard Johnson end up being on the first fleet to come here? Well, William Wilberforce is the man we need to thank for that. Uh, You might uh, know William Wilberforce as the man who campaigned uh, to bring an end to the slave trade and slavery in the UK. Uh, William Wilberforce was a gospel man, a Christian man, and he knew all too well that God wanted the gospel to go to all people to the ends of the earth. And so when he became aware in 1786 of plans for a fleet of convicts to be sent to this land, he thought, well, there are a lot of Indigenous people in that land to be reached. And there are convicts who need to be reached as well. You know what we need on that fleet? We need a chaplain. And so he got in touch with his friend, Prime Minister Pitt, and said, we really need a chaplain on that fleet. And Prime Minister Pitt agreed and he said, you've got a month to find someone. And so William, uh, uh, Mr Wilberforce and his uh, friends from the Clapham sect recruited Richard Johnson. And it's all a result of that that the gospel came to these shores. And friends, no doubt the hand of God was at work, working through William Wilberforce, helping him to see this way in which the gospel could spread, to see the way in which God's will could be obeyed. And we should give thanks for William Wilberforce and the initiative that he took because we benefit from that today. So friends, the gospel ended up here because God wants people of all nations, including our Indigenous sisters and brothers, to hear the good news about Jesus Christ. And friends, I want to suggest to you, it is a good thing that the gospel came here. And this brings us to our second point which is that the gospel is the ultimate source of comfort. The gospel is the ultimate source of comfort. That's why it's a good thing it's here. So in verses 14 to 15, we read this. From Perga, Barnabas and Paul went on to Pisidian Antioch. On the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them, saying, Brothers... If you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. So, as was their normal way, Paul and Barnabas rock up to the local synagogue. And they're sitting down. And I suspect the leaders of the synagogue, maybe by the way in which Paul was dressed, concluded that he was a rabbi. And uh, send a message. Brother, do you have a word of exhortation for us. Now that uh, word translated there as exhortation could also be translated as encouragement or comfort. Encouragement or comfort. Uh, You might remember in Isaiah 40, uh, God speaks words of comfort uh, to the people who are in exile. Comfort, comfort to my people, says God. Well, here are Jewish people living outside of the promised land, looking for words of comfort. And the Apostle Paul says, I've got the very words you need. And he starts preaching the gospel to them. And friends, what we see as the Apostle Paul preaches the gospel is that the gospel really is the ultimate source of comfort for two reasons. For two reasons. First of all, the gospel shows us how God's words and promises about the future can be trusted. Let me tell you, I reckon that one of the things that makes us uncomfortable in life is not knowing what the future holds. Uh, We're much more comfortable if we've got a sort of a sense of what the future holds. Uh, We feel uncomfortable when we have surprises sprung upon us, things unexpected. Well, friends, what the Apostle Paul shares in the Gospel is that God controls the future. God is sovereign over the future. Uh, God speaks hundreds of years before something happens and then makes it happen. We heard that in the kids' spot, didn't we? And what uh, Paul focuses on here in particular 
is how God spoke hundreds, if not a thousand years before the coming of Jesus and how all the events in Jesus' death and resurrection fulfil all the words that God had spoken earlier on. Indeed, uh, let's have a look at verses 27 and 29 where the people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognise Jesus. Now, it's not that they did not recognise what he looked like, they did not recognise that he was the Christ, that he was the Messiah, the great promised King. Yet, in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. I just want you to notice, Jesus' condemnation was in fulfilment of the words of the prophets. What happened to Jesus on the cross, well, that was all about what was written about him. Here the Apostle Paul is making the point that God spoke and down the track, what he said would happen indeed happened through Jesus. Now, as we heard about in the kids' spot, about a thousand years before the time of Jesus, God spoke through King David. Um, when you go home today, have a read of Psalm 22. Have a read of Psalm 22. It starts off with the words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you recognise those words from anywhere else? They're the words Jesus cries out on the cross. And as you read through Psalm 22, you see things like, uh, people mocking God's anointed one, saying, you know, if God is really on your side, you know, why doesn't he save you? Isn't it interesting? The same thing happens to Jesus. Uh, we read about how this anointed one, his, his garment is, is gambled away by people. They cast lots for it. Exactly what happened to Jesus. Uh, we read about how uh, none of Jesus' bones were broken in fulfilment of Psalm 22. So, so you see these details in Psalm 22 fulfilled a thousand years later in the death of Jesus. And probably one of the greatest passages that speaks about uh, the forthcoming death of Jesus is Isaiah 53, written some 700 to 800 years before the coming of Jesus. Read Isaiah 53 when you go home. Whenever I read it, it sounds like it's written by someone who was there when Jesus died. So vivid is the description, so accurate is a description of what took place with Jesus. And so here's the Apostle Paul, he's saying, you know what, a thousand years, 700 to 800 years before Jesus died, God said all this would happen. And when Jesus was condemned and when he died, everything that God had said would happen, did happen. And you know what's really interesting? It's the fact that those who put Jesus to death were actually acting in opposition to God when they did so. Yet even though they were acting in opposition to God, God still worked through them to bring about his good purposes in Jesus dying for us. We can see God's control of the future through the death of Jesus. We also see God's control of the future through the resurrection of Jesus. Have a look at verses 30 to 33. But God raised him from the dead and for many days he was seen by those who had travelled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second psalm, and here he quotes from Psalm 2 verse 7, You are my son, today I have become your father. Friends, Psalm 2 is based on a promise that God made elsewhere to King David about a thousand years before Jesus came into this world. A promise we find in 2 Samuel 7. A promise where God said to David that one of his descendants would be a king who would rule forever. This uh, king would be known as the son of God. And Psalm 2 picks up on this theme. Well, friends, what's Paul saying here? The resurrection of Jesus confirms that he was indeed this descendant of David who would rule forever. Jesus conquered death. 
He lives forever. He is the great king. In verse 23, Paul makes it clear that Jesus is one of David's descendants and by being raised from the dead, indeed, the day of his resurrection was in effect the day that Psalm 2 verse 7 speaks about. Today I have become your father. Today through the resurrection, the day of Jesus being raised from the dead, he was shown to be the true son of God, the great promised king. And as we go on, uh, in the verses following these, the Apostle Paul quotes from Isaiah 55, verse 3, from Psalm 16, verse 10, which make it clear that God's anointed one would not see decay, but that he would indeed make available the blessings that God had promised to King David. Again, what's the point? God said that Jesus would be raised from the dead. And in fulfilment of the Scriptures, that's exactly what happened. You see, God's so in control of the future that he can use those who oppose him to bring about his good purposes, but he can even overcome death. Nothing can stop God from doing that which he has promised in the future. Nothing can stop God from doing that which he has said will happen in the future. And for us as followers of Jesus, the fact that God is willing to keep his promises and has the ability to keep his promises brings great comfort. Because as followers of Jesus, we trust in God's promises. We trust in the promise of eternal life. We trust in the promise that we will be raised from the dead and be with our Lord forever. We trust in that promise. And here's the thing. Nothing can stop God from doing what he has promised. Nothing can stop God from doing what he has said will happen in the future. Some people might say, but it's been such a long time since Jesus said that he would return. Is God not keeping his promise there? No. Read 2 Peter 3. The reason why Jesus hasn't returned yet is because God wants more people to be saved. Friends, be comforted that no matter what life throws at you, no matter how bleak things might seem, that if you trust in the promises of God of eternal life, that nothing, nothing, no one will stop God from making that happen. That's comforting, isn't it? I don't have the ability to control the future. You don't have the ability to control the future, but God does. And if we trust in him, he does it for us. Praise God for that. Praise God. But there's another aspect of the gospel that brings us comfort, and that is that the gospel shows us how we can avoid the punishment we deserve in the future. As I mentioned, there is a day when Jesus will return to judge all people. We will be called to give an account for how we have lived as God's creatures in God's world. The reality is, we all deserve punishment. Because none of us will meet the standards that Jesus will judge by on that day. None of us are good enough for God. All of us have failed to obey God as we've been called to. All of us deserve punishment. And so, it's a scary thing to sort of think about that judgment is coming and that punishment is coming. But friends, the good news is that God has provided a way for us to avoid that punishment we deserve. Indeed, listen to what Paul says in verses 38 to 39. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. Not just some, but every sin. A justification you are not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Why did Jesus die on the cross as God said he would? To provide a way for us to be forgiven. That's why. On that cross, the punishment that we deserve was laid out upon Jesus so that we might be spared it. See, friends, it doesn't matter how hard we try, we can't make ourselves right with God. Indeed, in verse 39, the Apostle Paul talks about justification. That's the idea of being declared innocent by God. Notice he says, you know, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses doesn't how well you try and keep God's laws, you can never be declared right before God. That's why we need Jesus. That's why Jesus died for us. And the good news is that if we're forgiven, 
We don't have to worry about Judgment Day. It's not a day to fear. It's a day to look forward to. It's a day to be excited about because we'll be with our Lord forever. But friends, the fact that Jesus died on the cross and brought about forgiveness doesn't mean that everyone is now automatically forgiven and that everyone will now automatically be with the Lord on that day. Indeed, listen to what the Apostle Paul says in verses 40 to 41. He says, Take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. And here he quotes from Habakkuk 1 verse 5. Habakkuk 1 verse 5. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish. For I am going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you. Look at what happens to those who scoff at God's word, who refuse to accept it. They perish. They perish. And so really, friends, we're left with a choice, right? Judgment day is coming... Well, if we accept the gospel now, if we accept Jesus now, if we seek forgiveness through him now, we're not going to perish, but we'll live forever. But if we reject this word as the Jews did in Pisidian Antioch, if we reject that word, scoff against it, well, we'll be rejected on the day of judgment and perishing for eternity is what lies ahead. And so I urge you, friends, that the gospel brings great comfort because we know that God's got the future under control. We know his promises will be fulfilled. We know we can be forgiven and not have to fear judgment, but only if we accept the gospel now. Don't scoff at it, friends. Don't scoff because that leads to perishing. Accept it. But that leads to life and to comfort now. To life and to comfort now. And friends, as I wrap it all up, uh, again, I rejoice that the gospel came to this far-flung land. I rejoice that uh, God worked through William Wilberforce to make sure that there was a Christian chaplain on the First Fleet. I rejoice that our Indigenous sisters and brothers have had the opportunity to hear that gospel for themselves and to be blessed by it. Because, friends, it's the gospel which is the source of ultimate comfort. It reminds us that God's got the future under control. It reminds us that we can be forgiven and avoid the punishment we deserve. And, brothers and sisters, knowing that our God wants his gospel going to Jews and Gentiles to the ends of the earth, surely that should be prompting us as the people of God to be raising up more and more people and sending them to places where the gospel has not yet been heard just as William Wilberforce worked to make sure that there was a chaplain come to this country. So we need to work to make sure that there are people going to places where the gospel has not been heard so those people can hear it. For many of us, we might not be thinking so much about the overseas, but friends, there are people in Layla Park and Kings Langley and Seven Hills and Blacktown and Glenwood and other places around here who need to hear about Jesus, who currently don't have the comfort that the gospel brings. And so let us seek to reach them and bring the comfort that they so desperately need. Later this term, from March 26 to April 2, we're going to have a week of mission where we're going to intensify our efforts to do that. There's a sense we're always on mission, but we're going to intensify our efforts that week. And we'll talk more in the weeks to come about how you can participate in that. But why do we do that? Why do we run weeks of mission? Why are we interested in trying to reach people? Well, because God wants people reached. And we want to reach people, why? Well, because just as God has comforted us through the gospel, helping us to see that the future is all taken care of, so we should want to now help bring comfort to others who currently don't have it. Let me now pray for us that we might indeed do that. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise that in 1788, the gospel came to these shores. We thank you that Richard Johnson and others who followed him preached that gospel faithfully and made disciples of Jesus, not just of the white settlers, but also of our Indigenous sisters and brothers. Our Father God, it grieves us that our Indigenous sisters and brothers have endured the harm that they have. 
And it grieves us that uh, churches could have done more in the past. And so, Father, help us not to follow those mistakes. But help us, Father, to be seeking to spread your word of comfort to all people, to our Indigenous sisters and brothers, to people in the suburbs around us, And to raise up people to go to people groups who have not yet heard the gospel so that more and more people can know about the great comfort that the gospel brings. Thank you that in the gospel we know that you control the future, that your promises are sure. Thank you that in the gospel we know forgiveness of sins and that we don't have to fear judgment in the future. Father, thank you for the comfort of the gospel and help us to bring comfort to others by making it known to them. And we pray for these things now in Jesus' precious name. Amen.